Welcome to Compassionate Cultures, the podcast. You're about to go on a journey of empathy, understanding and transformation. Get ready to dive into the heart of humanity's most pressing questions with me, Rebecca Hemmings, the CEO of Strawberry Words Training Consultancy and guests. It's time to turn up the volume on kindness and to amplify the voices of minorities that often go unheard. This podcast asks questions like, how can we create workplaces where ethnic minorities thrive without the chains of career stagnation? What if universities were safe havens for all, free from the storm of microaggressions? And how can we bridge the gaps between cultures that have been divided by the walls of bias and ignorance? This is not just a podcast. This is a revolution of empathy. Welcome to Compassionate Cultures, the podcast. Get ready to explore, learn and change the world one compassionate conversation at a time. Wonderful. So we are recording. All right, Nathan, ready to go? All good, yeah. Brilliant. Hello, everybody. My name is Sipo Eric Injovu, and I am here on behalf of Strawberry Words as a co-host on the Compassionate Cultures podcast, where we are wanting to change the world with one compassionate conversation at a time. And now this time, we have a very, very special guest, um, someone I'm inspired by um, and also informed by because you you work in an awesome industry, Nathan. <laughs> um, various industries, for that matter. <laughs> various, various. <Yeah. laughs> um, and I'm very fascinated by your approach. And of course, we are going to get into that as well. Mm. Um, so uh, to, just to let everybody um, else know and give some context, um, we, we have with us here today, Nathan Ade, who is an animator um, and um, an incredible creative writer and poet um, who has won um, uh, several awards and continues to be nominated as well um, through your your passion and your ambition. Now, um, Nathan, I want you to fill in the gaps um, as to what has almost won you these awards um, and what it is that you actually do. Um, so would you mind us um, starting there? Um, how would you introduce yeah. yourself, Nathan, with the work that you do? I appreciate that. That's a great intro, by the way. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> you've given me a good... Uh, one up there um so yeah just to also give context to your audience as well me and you met through um a bbc commission project called mental roots so that's what birthed what has now become a multimedia brand which i'll talk about today so it's been quite the journey from this short animation that we were working on um but yeah i have to give a shout out to rural media um mm. and their new creative scheme um, and obviously shout out to Anna Campbell as well, who was our producer for the hey. short film. Um, so yeah, all the way back in 2020, which in one way feels like a long time ago. And then in another sense, the time has flown as well. Um, I can't believe it's like been four years now. I <laughs> know. Years. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, Sipo in a way was, um, I don't know, it feel, I think in the credits, you're a co-writer, which feels fair in a way, because <laughs> um, the the me initial Mental Roots animation um, was all focused on black, uh, well, mental health from a black male perspective. Mm. Um, and I'll start from there, like in terms of describing who I am, I would say, yes, I do specialize in animation. I studied it as my degree. Mm. Um, and then I did a master's developing my animation. Um, but there's also obviously, as Sipo has said, various aspects to me. I like spoken word and rap. Um, Back in the day in school, I used to do a bit of performing arts as well. So I like expressing myself in a variety of creative ways. Um, but in the recent years, I've thought more about social issues. And a, a little slogan of mine that I've adopted is making work that not only looks good, but does good. Mm. Um, and so I guess even before the whole Mental Roots thing came about, um, in my coursework in uni um, from second year onwards, I was already starting to think about what sort of social issues can I comment on? So I started to address um, youth issues and like religion and beliefs in my animations. Um, and then in the final year of my degree, that was when I learned about Rural Media's new creatives program, mm. where you pitch a short film on that idea 
And if they like it, they'll put some funding behind it and then um, broadcast it with the, from the BBC. Um, and so long story short, that's how the Mental Roots animation came about. And yeah, we um, uh, Anna introduced Sipo to me um, and we worked really well on developing the spoken word narration for that animation. And since then we've kept in touch. Um, as I was making that animation, it birthed the idea to do the Mental Roots podcast mm. um, because obviously 2020, um, which was the year I started working on the animation, that was a very pivotal year you know when it comes to this thing called you know equality diversity and inclusion you know um i'm sure me and you we've already started thinking of talking about you know um i guess the pros and cons that came out of the whole black lives matter quote unquote awakening in 2020 right. um but of course it was a timely period for me to kind of build the brand um and start in the podcast aspect so a lot's happened since then um i've started to build mental roots as a business and thinking about ways I can provide services. So whether it's further like freelance design um, commissions or whether it's, you know, um, workshops for young people, which I started doing last year. Mm. Um, I'm just looking at various ways I can hopefully, you know, build a living from, you know, doing all creative things that raise awareness on black mental health. Um, mm -hmm. Because obviously uh, there's corporations are, interested in different capacities as to yep. how to help you know those from ethnically diverse backgrounds when it comes to representation being issues that affect our mental health and and all sorts so um yeah that pretty much sums up where i'm at and just to add more i guess professional mental health experience and knowledge to the brand um, i'm currently working as a recovery worker mm. at a, a service for um, adults um, locally so here in Derby, where I currently live, um, mm -hmm. it's just basically helping doing sessions with clients. And, you know, I, we always make it clear we're not trained therapists, mm -hmm. but we do grow through like basic CBT techniques, which stands for cognitive behavioral therapy. Mm -hmm. So just more practical things to help them in their moment of crisis and then signposting them to longer term support. So um, that I've been doing that for just over a year. Um, but now or, and at the same time here and there where I can, I've been doing a few commissions um and yeah last year was very crazy but hopefully moving forward i can find a more sustainable you know um way to obviously um you know have a regular income but at the same time build the business so that's currently where i'm at <laughs> amazing yeah no thank you so much for allowing us to catch up um and being so open mm -hmm. as well with where you are presently um, because one of the reasons I'm inspired by you, and I really do mean that, um, Nathan, is because having known you and seen you progress over the last few years, um, I've had some insight in, into you being so socially conscious. Um, mm -hmm. And I've always wondered when that started for you. You are mm -hmm. clearly so talented um, and you're gifted as well. Um, but you use your talents to connect with more people um, and to spread positivity, especially when it comes to inclusivity and insight as well. Um, yeah. So your business, your brand, um, and what I've seen of your work, um, introducing people to um, Black mental health has mm. been quite profound. So I just want mm. to try and go a little back and so younger yeah, yeah. Than, if that's okay mm -hmm. um yeah, yeah. so you, 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 you already mentioned that you know in school you, you used to do performing arts and I'm like mm, we might come back to that but um yeah, yeah, yeah. when did you start um you know being um socially conscious and um yeah, yeah. when did that journey begin for you um so obviously just to provide some background um I know we we had a conversation on similar themes on my my podcast the mental yeah. roots podcast so for those listening that's i think that's season one you hey i know you're enjoying the podcast episode but i just want to quickly come in and say look if you're an organization that needs anti-racism training for your organization because your staff are lacking in a racial literacy they don't have the words they get stuck when talking about racism they they want to be able to deal with incidents but they're not sure how to then check out our time to talk about race online cpd accredited course at strawberrywords.co.uk okay we can train from 
10 to 10,000. But get in touch today at admin at strawberrywords.co.uk. Now back to the episode. Can check that out. I think it's episodes 14 and 15 um, or thereabouts. Um, but yeah, I think, yeah, like I've probably said to you before, I did grow up in a Christian home. Mm. Um, grew up, well, it's interesting because born, born in Leicester, shortly after that, moved, um, lived in Ghana for a little bit, which is where I'm from. Um, and yeah, like that was like the first three years of my life and then moved back to the UK, we lived in London for a bit. And then Essex. So I moved around here and there. Um, but throughout that, I've had a great upbringing, just kind of um, the growing up in the Christian faith and seeing how, you know, so I've always grown up in a morally aware mm. background um, and, you know, at church as well, seeing people share their testimonies and hearing about a God who, you know, transforms people for the better. And you know, so I've always had this, um awareness of you know god being in everything um and that there's always some sort of redemptive value in yeah. every person and in every situation um obviously at home the cds would pretty much all be gospel music um and then obviously with <laughs> um music channels and stuff like that on tv that would be my window into the world of hip hop and right. everything else pretty much so it was quite a mixed bag of influences growing up. Um, but yeah, I think in terms of like, in terms of creative expression, I've always been drawing for as early as I remember. Mm. Um, always had a very um, particular um, talent for drawing and imagination. Um, it makes me wish that I kept more of my childhood drawings now because um, <laughs> a lot of what I used to draw, you know, it would astound the teachers and, that would carry on throughout my school career, just the level of detail and the, um, you know, it, it was something I've always kind of done without having to practice too much. Normally people would have to go through a lot of tutorials to learn how to draw, but I've never really felt like I have to learn to draw. I've always learned how to develop the talent, but it's always been a natural talent of mine. Um, but yeah, so I think in primary school, it was more just being inspired by mainstream kind of Disney and, Pixar films and you know Sony Pictures Animation and a few other kind of Hollywood um, studios mm. I think when I was in secondary school um, it was when I had a deeper understanding of my faith that then inspired me to think more about positive messages mm. um, obviously I think when you become a teenager you become just a little bit more aware of how the world works you know um, you become 12 and then 15 and then you watch films that <laughs> give you an insight on the adult world you know so I think as I was learning more about the complexities of how the world works then I realized like oh wow you know there's a lot of issues going on you know there's racism there's also um, a lot of people have misconceptions about faith as well um, mm. and what it means to be a Christian and all these different things um, and even for me I started going to Christian youth events um, there used to be this Christian um, summer uh, event called Soul Survivor mm -hmm. um, and so I started to go with my church youth group throughout my teens and I started seeing rappers and singers and mm -hmm. pop stars and all sorts of creatives who were boldly declaring their faith and it opened my eyes because it was like it made me realize that you can create positive creative content that is still cool you know and that isn't too cheesy yeah um and so that really kind of inspired me you know i started listening to christian rappers and then in secondary school there was more performing arts opportunities in primary school i never really gotten a window of you know the like going into drama or you know trying music there, there were these sort of things but there wasn't a lot of push behind it mm -hmm. but in secondary school i then started to do drama as a subject for the first time and the performing arts helped me at the time to really develop my confidence because um coming in in year seven um I remember I was really introverted and quite shy um but yeah just learning you know performing on stage and um at first obviously I wasn't playing any main roles but there were a few mm -hmm. like extracurricular opportunities that you know um helped me like in using my voice for other characters that like it kind of helped me find my own voice in a way 
Yeah. Um, so that's why I'm so passionate about the creative arts because it kept me engaged during school. Um, it helped me develop my confidence. And um, yeah, you know, I think that's a blessing considering so many different distractions and things can come during those years. Mm. Um, but obviously I had the church and I had activities at school to kind of keep me grounded and develop my you know sense of purpose so mm. um that's pretty much the the background really um is that you know creative creative expression has always been a safe space for me uh to just be myself and you know talk about things that I think deeply about um mm. but you know people don't want to really read an essay on those things they want but they would rather hear a song or you know watch a play Definitely. or something about a a certain topic so yeah that's that's pretty much sums up my uh, experience <laughs> amazing yeah no really appreciate that especially your last point as well um about access um uh and i i, mm. I could always tell that you think quite deeply um about subject matters um and you're, you're right um you know that there's a lot happening and that has been happening and people may not want to read an essay about it um, um, sorry for any mm. writers listening, but we, we love the writers out here. Um, and, and, and you and I will read the essay, mm -hmm. but um, I, I, mm -hmm. I, I, I have seen through your your work that you can consolidate so much um, in a song, um, but then also um, mm. in a piece of visual animation, you know, um, and moving images. Um, and so th th this is one of my next mm -hmm. um, questions as well, because I, I, as you know, at Sh Sh Strawberry w w um, Words, as anti-racism trainers, mm -hmm. we give so much insight to organizations, um, not only about how they can operate around their own um, environment, uh, but then um, out in the world as well. Um, and so talking to people yeah, yeah. like um, your, yourself um, with real life experience of the work that you're doing, which is um, actually contributing to that, um, uh, will hopefully inspire um, some other creative thinking around it. Um, and so with your work, um, I, I actually want to ask you about um, one of your <clears throat> um, aesthetic choices. Um, so this is now um, from the, the mental um, roots, um, you know, no brand and, 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 the, and the films that, that we've seen. Um, the cracked egg, um, you, you know, that image. Um, yeah. so, so for anyone who, who doesn't know what we're talking about, um, this is your prompt to um, watch one of Nathan's um, short films, which we can link. Um, and make sure yeah, that yeah. people um, see those. Um, but yeah. Nathan, yeah, for, for anyone who hasn't seen it or anyone who has, mm -hmm. um, yeah, to, to talk us through um, what is the aesthetic that I'm talking about? Because you can explain yeah, it better. Yeah. Um, and where did it come from um, as well? Yeah. Mm. Cool, yeah. So as I said, you know, this Mental Roots brand was birthed from this initial animation called Mental Roots. So it's um, just under four minutes long. And um, the best way, to, I mean, to describe it is a spoken word narrated journey from uh, a young black character's perspective, kind of journeying through um, the changing state of his mental health. And he's trying to unpack what's kind of led to him being at that moment and where he's going to go from here. Um, and there's a lot of visual, I call it visual metaphors, because um, I feel like imagery with... Um, pictures and imagery with words can really complement each other um I'm not going to say I'm the first definitely not the first person to put spoken word poetry with animation mm. but I think using it in the way that I've done to talk about the sort of things I'm talking about is a, a unique thing um that I haven't seen many other people do um specifically as it pertains to black culture and mm. showing that in in animation um, but I feel like, yes, yeah, so describing um, the visual style, it's it represents, I would say, the down to earthness or the grittiness of the subject matter. So it is quite pastely in aesthetic um, for all of the production geeks out there. Um, I use Photoshop quite a bit um, and Photoshop has kind of been my go to the past few years in terms of 2D animation because of the, the range of different brushes and the organic textures um, and and speaking of which, you know, there, there are other types of software I want to use as well, um, which I haven't <laughs> made time to practice with yet. But um, I, at least I know I've got the transferable skills to, you know, learn those different kinds of software so that I can equip myself with a wider 
variety of styles and brushes and and etc right but where i'm at now you know with the the style i've got is again quite a pastely feel to it um and you know the visual imagery is very fluid i, I don't like using sharp cuts in my animations um particularly with mental roots i just felt like um as as much as the subject matter within the poem kind of smoothly transitions from line to line i wanted to show that visually um and obviously i remember the when we were talking about when when we were drafting the poem together i pretty much already had it fleshed out more or less but i remember you gave me a lot of useful insight in fleshing out the poem and talking about well if we're going to include this detail um in the words then how how does that complement what could come visually mm. um so that was a very interesting unique aspect to consider that you know this poem isn't just by itself it's part of a bigger you know product you know where there's going to be sound effects and you know um <laughs> and imagery so um that's that's uh the best way i could describe it is that you know there's you've got a lot of smooth transitions um and and the head the whole head shell so i describe that as a head shell but even oh, right. describing even describing <laughs> what it is is yeah, that's what i'm trying to say yeah, yeah because <laughs> like the whole idea of the head shell is like because i could have gone with just the standard idea of a mask right because obviously when we talk about black culture and the stigma of mental health in in the community um obviously a lot of people will understand what i mean when i say we wear masks to mask our, our true emotions and to mask our pain and especially in black culture over the years um what has been mostly a gift but also maybe um a blockage to true vulnerability is our talent you know we've always been using the performing arts music storytelling to process our trauma in the black community and 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 turn it into something beautiful that is now obviously very marketable on a worldwide scale yeah. um but the the cost of that is you know do we even know when we're wearing the mask and when we're not yeah. because we're yeah. so used to living in a performative way you know whether it's um subconsciously you know um taking on the stereotypes of black identity that we see in western you know culture or whether it's even from our ancestry you know we there's not been that education on mental health so we just all we know is just being strong and powering through working twice as hard as our counterparts you know um yeah. and so these are the sort of masks that i wanted to allude to in the film but i thought i wanted to think of a more unique kind of imagery so the whole head shell analogy is that it completely blocks your peripheral vi vision um and it's like you create your own inner world it's almost like a vr headset but like mm -hmm. as if it's a helmet sort of thing um and so yeah i i, I wanted to i don't know I, it's, it's a bit weird like i didn't think too much about the particular look of it it just naturally came to me like just as if someone's putting a head shell on their head um because i don't know maybe it's because an, a, a shell is a bit more of a natural um analogy in a way um but I, I just thought of it initially and then i kind of run with it um but also i thought it was interesting how even in the animation you see the character pick up pieces and out of these pieces he makes a head shell mm. so that's the analogy that you know out of our um poverty or out of our lack in the black community we create our own safety spaces we create our own coping mechanisms mm. you know basically out the out of the broken pieces of his life he builds this head shell that you know um when you when you see the animation he wears it and you we get sucked into his kind of uh coping mechanism which mm -hmm. which is then basically being with the mandem being on the block mm. just you know spitting rhymes and the nice thing about that scene is that um, inherently it's a, both a celebration and a critique of, you know, um, the way that we kind of socialize in, in the black community is that on one hand, it's great that, you know, we've got rap as an art form to have a bit of healthy competition. And in a way it sharpens our talent. Um, and obviously the, the roots of grime kind of started out with clashes of just kind of random, you know, um, rap freestyle um clashes on the streets 
but even in that environment you know that's like the typical environment where you're not encouraged to be vulnerable or mm. talk about oh i'm going through this struggle you can't be seen as weak so you have to put on this mask you know um and so yeah that, that's kind of the long answer to what you were saying is that um that head shell kind of represents um just in you know coping through life and putting on a fake expression so on the shells you see fake expressions painted on um and then you know a piece might fall off and then you'll see a character is actually crying mm -hmm. under that head eggshell but under the under that head shell rather and but he wants to shield that and he puts the piece back on to mask that emotion because he just wants people to see a simulation of who he is um and that simulation is something that he's trying to live up to but um it's not where he's currently at mm -hmm. um and so you know that that's kind of the main analogy but there's also other visual metaphors within the animation as well that i'll let other people figure out <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much for that, Nathan. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much um, for your insights. Um, and again, I would absolutely en encourage people uh, to watch Mental Roots um, because what you've just yeah. described is the everyday living condition. Um, so putting on mm. this mask um, as part yeah. of our racism training, um, it definitely re reminds me of whenever we talk about um, code switching, um, that mm. many people feel as though that they have to um, emulate um, as part of assimilating into a culture which maybe isn't isn't theirs, and, and they don't feel represented within. Um, but yeah, mm. I think I think your your film is another great example um, of the ways that. Uh, many people can probably relate to but especially um uh, people of color th throughout the western world mm. um so going back to now your um, experience and your insight my, my next my next question um it's almost about if you yourself have identified a gap um within mm. your industry um your, yeah, your, yeah. Your, your your creative industry where the subject matters that you address um as, as far as um mental health and equality um it, 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 is there a gap in in that market mm. and um do people not talk about it enough and do people not work on it enough you know um yeah yeah, yeah please give us some so, 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 some insight there mm. yeah i think there is definitely a gap in terms of i think high quality animation that at least gets recognized in the bigger you know animation industry circles um it's an interesting one because part of me thinks you know that the shift the industry is shifting in the sense that um there's a lot more content creators coming out now um in terms of podcasts with animation Obviously, I don't know if you've heard of Past the Meerkat. I, I have, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so that I think is maybe one of a few examples I can think of where mm -hmm. animation is being used in an accessible way to authentically connect with young people, mainly of multi-ethnic backgrounds. Yeah. Um, and obviously with the style, with it being a podcast, then, you know, the, the imagery is very much kind of vectorized, very simple very kind of accessible in that sense mm. um but also doing an animation degree and learning about you know the british animation awards and um you know the the scene of independent animators and the sort of animators who are lecturing at um you know various institutions and you know it, kind of like that sort of um specialist um sector um i rarely see people from black backgrounds you know in that space um at yeah. least in the uk anyway um obviously in america they they have got a lot more variety um going on in terms of representation and animation um obviously on a hollywood level we all know about spider-man into the spider-verse mm -hmm. um and the same studio sony pictures animation they did the short film hair love mm -hmm. um, which i think was based on an existing book but now they're developing it into a series on i think it's on netflix um and then there's various other kind of examples in american history where uh, i know there's one 
Um, I know of one um, black owned animation studio in America called Lion Forge. Mm. Um, I think they were the people behind uh, or at least helped to make hair love. Um, and so that's a studio that I've started to look into and, um, you know, then there's various other uh, people within the States who are from a black background um, who, you know, have, have done great work in the mainstream. Um, but in the UK specifically, right. um, I think there's still a long way to go in terms of really seeing a new scene of, of black Brit British animators. I do know obviously of students and young people who are doing animation, but there's not much of a collective or much of a, you know, I don't really see a black owned studio that's really, mm. you know, having a mainstream impact in that sense. So I think in terms of like, mainstream appeal and seeing high quality animation that's not only made by black creators but the stories within those animations are really relevant to to our communities you know right. that really un celebrates our culture our heritage our music um the 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 the, the various nuances to what it means to be black british we I, even in independent animation because there's something I did my dissertation on um, for the BA and then also my master's as well there's only as like I could count on one hand the amount of uh, independent animators I've seen study or w release films in the independent animation scene in the UK that are black mm -hmm. um, and a few of them I've connected with them on LinkedIn so um, obviously I'll shout out Mary Martins who um, went to I think it must it might have been RCA, um, but she's done a few kind of independent animations and mm -hmm. um, been through a few um, short film festivals and things. Um, and and, and, and like, for us who don't know, and what, what's RCA? Sorry, uh, Royal College of Arts. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. If Mary's hearing this, then Mary <laughs> just correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but yeah, you know, connecting with people like her and. Another guy called Osbert Parker, who back in the 90s, especially he was working with the likes of, I think, MTV and mm. very. And, and But even then, you know, when you look at the history of black animators, which was hard to find, you know, any concrete stuff or, or concrete text on that. Um, it used to be always going to the States, really. You know, you try and um, do your try and make your, your name known um, in the animation world. And it seems that the best place to really get your shot is the States. And in, in, in just in film in general, it's been a similar thing with a lot of actors, um, you know, the likes of David Harewood and Idris Elba. We've seen how pretty much they had to make it big in America in order to yeah. then make it big in the, in the UK. So in, in a, on a much smaller scale, in one sense, it seems to be that way with animation as well. But um, even just animation in Britain generally is there's a lot more niche and smaller in terms of market and revenue than um, in the States. I think that's starting to shift a little bit now, um, mm. especially with Ardman being on the, on the grow. But um, so I think just British animation generally has always had its own quirkiness to it um, and always in some ways subverted the clean cut traditional um, aesthetic that America is known for, you know, through the likes of Walt Disney. So British animation generally has that kind of history of being a bit more sub subversive. And, you know, even during the World War, World War II, you know, animation was used in a lot of commercials and it was very sharp, very minimalistic animation to get a message across. Um, and so in, in kind of carrying on with that lineage, I, I want to, I feel inspired. So I know you're really enjoying this episode, but unfortunately it's come to an end for now, but they will be part two. So watch out for that coming up very soon. Thank you so much for listening to Compassionate Cultures, the podcast.